that there's something large and ancient lurking in these waters. The Highlands of Northern Scotland. Speak to the inhabitants around Loch Ness and many have seen something that brings the legend to life. I'm driving along the loch side, glancing out of the window, and I, I saw this, as I say, described to me like this boiling in the water. And I looked up at the loch, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw this black hump came out of the water. About 30 feet in length, and nearly 10 feet in height from the water to the top of the back. It seemed as if it had been still and started to move off, but there was a, a, a neck and it flipped over, just flipped right over like that, crashed down, and you could see it. There's the chance. I've seen something in the water, but, but what is it? Is this what they're seeing? A photograph taken in 1934 shows an unknown animal, or an elaborate hoax. This film was shot by an aeronautical engineer in 1960. When computer processed, it shows a featureless black hump, quite different from the boat filmed later that day for comparison. Both are moving at 10 miles an hour. Royal Air Force photographic experts concluded that the hump is at least six feet wide and five feet high, probably an animate object. Is there something here? Many have tried to solve the mystery without success. But the quest continues. Today, a new expedition arrives to search the law. The leader is Bob Rhines. Rhines is a man of many accomplishments, a respected lawyer and founder of a law school. He was trained in science and engineering and helped in the development of both radar and sonar. But his true passion is a pursuit that few scientists take seriously, the hunt for the Loch Ness Monster. If you don't have an open mind, in my judgment, you're not a scientist. If you don't have ideas, if you don't have adventure, if you don't have an open mind, you'll never make a discovery. And I think there's a misconception that science has to be something rigid, something sponsored by NASA or the government or millions of dollars. I mean, a scientist is a scientist. I don't care where you put him. Reince's longtime partner in the search is Charles Wyckoff, a photographic innovator with over 60 patents to his name. Wyckoff created the film stocks that captured the first images of atomic bomb explosions and moon landings. It took time for this trained scientist to warm to the idea of the monster. At first I said it was a myth, then I became an agnostic. And then pretty soon I said, gee, you know, there's more to it than that. I guess there's something down there. And then I got really intrigued. And uh, the more instrumentation I cooked up, the more intrigued I became. For these two men, this expedition might well be the final chapter in a quest that began 30 years ago when Rhines, on a chance visit to Loch Ness, became intrigued by the mystery. We can still do it, can't we? Yep. As a lawyer used to dealing with eyewitness testimony, he found the accounts of sightings persuasive. I just got this strong feeling that everybody wasn't a liar. Everybody wasn't a fool. But there was something there. His hunch turned to conviction in the summer of 1972 when he and his wife Carol had an experience that would haunt them forever. And we came out on the field, and over there, we looked down. And there was this big grayish hump. It went out against the wind currents into the mouth of Ercot Bay. It turned around and came back right in front of us and Sank. 
The sighting inspired Rhines to mount an expedition, combining old technologies in new ways. He aimed a sonar out into the depths and nearby placed a camera with a strobe light to take pictures every 45 seconds. After weeks of waiting, the plan finally paid off. Early in that morning, about one o'clock, we began to see the salmon jumping all over this bay. The rivers were dry, so they couldn't go up to spawn. And we could see it on the sonar too, you see the fish moving. And then these big target came in on the sauna, and we were praying it was just the right distance that the Edgerton camera could pick up something if we were lucky. For thousands of frames, there was nothing but dark, murky water. Then, suddenly, three frames showing an object reflecting the strobe light back at the camera. After computer enhancement at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the image revealed a flipper-like shape, some six feet long. We got at least three frames corroborated by similar images on the sonar target. That was a thrill. Rhines's success brought him back to the lock in subsequent years. New sonar hits and this image, in which some see the body and neck of a large animal, helped win another important convert, one of Britain's most respected naturalists, Sir Peter Scott. What I'm saying is that there is a body of evidence which I am prepared to accept, which cannot be explained in terms of known phenomena. With Scott's support, the idea that there might be a creature in Loch Ness gained new credibility. To techniques they were also were given the chance to present their findings to a hearing at the House of Commons. Experiments relating to these large animals. Our sole objective to get the zoological community all over the world, as well as other scientists, to analyze what we have produced, and indeed to debate what these things may be, and to get sufficiently interested that scientists dare to come to Loch Ness. For a moment, Rhines had the attention of the scientific world. But his case for Nessie was soon embroiled in controversy. The flipper photo, already computer enhanced by NASA, on further processing became this image, raising doubts about its validity. For, um, Even more controversial was Scott's bold yeah, conclusion, uh, yeah. based on the eyewitness sightings and the shape of the flipper, that Nessie was a plesiosaur a prehistoric aquatic reptile thought to have died out some 65 million years ago. Zoologists at the Natural History Museum ridiculed the idea. Uh, it seems to me that we have been invited to accept that in a relatively small body of water, in what is from the zoological viewpoint one of the best explored countries in the world, we have a population of large predatory reptiles which could be warm-blooded uh, and which might even be cannibals with snorkels. Now this I find very difficult to take. We fought shy a little bit of the lock. One of my predecessors at the museum was actually sacked from his job for going up on the lock. And probably the monster here has had a very bad effect on science in that many scientists had a nervous twitch when the lock was mentioned. For reasons you'll quite understand, it could be the kiss of death to your career. I think they got frightened. Those who make their living from this as zoologists are not ready to believe on the basis of one picture that something that should have been dead 65 million years ago is still existing in some form at Loch Ness, Scotland. As the years passed with no follow-up by zoologists, Ryans felt growing pressure to find out what it was he'd seen. Today, with only Wyckoff left of the original team, it's probably their last attempt. Searching Loch Ness is an enormous task. Stretching 24 miles from the Caledonian Canal to Inverness, where the River Ness empties out into the sea. The loch fills a deep chasm with sheer walls plunging 800 feet down making it the largest body of water in Britain.
to search this vast expanse, Rhines has assembled a team of scientists and engineers, all volunteers. Hey, Arnie. How are you? Pretty good. How is it? The sonar experts, oceanographer John Fish and marine biologist Arnie Carr, are partners in a leading sonar company. I haven't seen any thermals yet as far as the water column goes. I specialize, and my partner specializes in locating hard to find underwater targets. So I just view this as another opportunity to look in a body of water we haven't been in before. High above the lock, Fish and his assistant install a relay station for their global positioning system, a key tool in Rhines's new, more intensive search strategy. Instead of waiting for the creature to come to him, this time Rhines will sweep the lock with sonar. If the sonar team finds a target, the GPS will give them a precise location. The camera team, close behind in a second boat, will attempt to capture the target on film. I, I'm, I made a slight change in the camera, so we better make sure this thing is going to fit all right. Okay, I'll open up the front. Getting pictures will take all Wyckoff's ingenuity. You got the frame? Yep. Loch Ness is filled with peat particles washed down from the surrounding hills. The yellow haze limits visibility to a few feet. It's like driving down the road at, at night in a fog. Your, your, your headlights create this fog and you can't see the road. Now if we could separate the headlights off to the side, you'd have a better chance. You'd see the road. So I'm doing the same thing here. I'm separating the light source from the camera. With most of the expedition's limited funds devoted to sonar, Wyckoff and his colleague Sheldon Apsell have had to improvise. They've assembled a rig with a low-light video camera and a car headlight mounted on an aluminium frame left over from an expedition in the 70s. So all this stuff that looks like it came out of somebody's garage actually works? It actually works, yeah. It worked 20 years ago, it'll work now. The last team member will play a very different role. Hello, Bob. Hey, hi there, Agent. Well, a long time. It's, what are you up to? We're going to scour the southern part of this lock today <laughs> with with the uh, sight scan and... Uh, you don't give up, do you? <laughs> never give up, never give up. Just about down to... Local naturalist Adrian Schein came to the lock in the hopes of solving the mystery. But 20 years of research have convinced him that there is no monster here. This has put him at odds yes. with Rhines on more than one occasion. In Bob Rhines, you have an enthusiastic scientist or engineer, perhaps, and at the same time, a lawyer. In the law, you need an instant answer. We don't actually mind whether the law gets things right, so long as the process is seen to be fair. And an advocate is not obliged to produce the negative side of any contention. An advocate is obliged purely to promote one side of a case. Working with us and Despite their strongly opposing views, Rhines has asked Shine to lend his expertise to the expedition. Okay, well, we'll dig out what we can. Great. And, uh, and good luck. Well, thank you. You better get on with it. You better, while, while the sun's still shining. <laughs> okay. Bob Rhines is undoubtedly extremely enthusiastic. Uh, he he, cer he certainly uses a good deal of imagination, uh, but then without people with imagination, nothing happens anyway. With the preparations completed, the members of the team are anxious to get started. But now time has come for us to get going. We only got five days with all the equipment. For purposes we, we basically came here for, we got to scour this lake. of a century after Rhines's first triumph. He and his team are back in the hunt. As the team begins the search, the mood is optimistic. 
In a lake where the largest known fish is a salmon, reports of moving sonar targets some 15 feet in length have persisted over the last 10 years. The most ambitious search ever made of Loch Ness was Operation Deep Scan in 1987. A flotilla of boats mounted with fish-finding sonar spent a week sweeping the loch. Most of the targets they encountered were easy to explain, but not all. The expedition leader was Adrian Schein. Three contacts we still can't explain, but that does not mean we never will explain them. In 1994, the Natural History Museum took part in Project Urca, the first major effort to study the ecology of the loch. Monsters were not on the agenda, yet its sonar experts said they too found large moving targets. It's hard to say exactly what it was. We followed it for at least seven, eight, nine minutes, but it's very difficult to say exactly what it was. They did find all sorts of interesting sonar targets, including moving targets. We've no idea what they were. If others can stumble on these targets, Rhines is hoping a systematic search will find them. The boat is packed with high-tech gear, including a fish-finding sonar attached to the hull and a side-scan sonar trailing behind. As Rhines and his team sweep the lock with acoustic technology, Wyckoff is rediscovering the difficulty of taking pictures in Loch Ness. Moisture has seeped in and ruined the camera. They will have to wait for a replacement. The timing couldn't be worse. Aboard the sonar boat, the fish finder has picked up a large target. What you got? got some very big echoes here on the surface. Oh, yeah. How deep are they? They're not that deep. They're only about, uh, what, 20 meters down? You haven't had anything like that before? No, right? I've never seen anything quite as big as that before. Oh, my goodness. Quite a hard echo. Well, the side scan might pick that up if it's not directly over it. It may not be directly over it. Could if pick it the up. side scan sonar picks up the target, it may That's reveal it. more. But interpretation can be difficult. With sound waves bouncing off the steep sides, the loch is notorious for generating misleading sonar images. Even thermals, changes in the water temperature, can create apparent targets where none exist. That target should have been here by now. I see bottom returns. I don't see anything in the water column. Could it be, uh, could it be our beam is too low? I think it is. We may not have gone over it, uh, yet, maybe right there, but I think our fish is too low in the water, much closer to the bottom. The target that was seen on the sonar, on the, on the depth finder, was, was high. Whatever the target was, the tow fish passed beneath it and failed to pick it up. Uh, Rhines to the camera crew. We had a whopping big target on Gordon's sonar but unfortunately not on the side scan because we're, so we're going to It's a tantalizing start. Even Carr is beginning to believe there may be something here. Uh, I think there's a phenomenon here or, or something that is really interesting. Really, I would like to get an answer to. And we had a target today. It didn't look like a thermal to me. It looked more biological, but I don't know what it was. For Rhines, this unconfirmed hit is an encouraging sign. Could the creature he and thousands of others believe they have witnessed still be here? The sightings began when a new road gave travelers their first good views of Loch Ness. It was here in 1933 that two local residents reported seeing an enormous animal rolling and plunging on the surface. An account of their sighting in the local paper brought the news of the beast to the rest of the world. The Loch Ness Monster soon became a media phenomenon. Capturing an image of the elusive beast has been a favorite pastime ever since. Some photographers resorted to outright fraud. 
others succumbed to the lark's powers of deception. Boatwakes, wildlife, and floating debris have all been mistaken for monsters. But one photograph stood out from the rest. Taken in 1934 and attributed to a reputable London surgeon, Dr. R. Kenneth Wilson, it seemed to show an unidentified animal surfacing on the loch. For many, it was the definitive image of Nessie. Until 1994, when a story broke claiming this classic photo was an elaborate hoax. The man responsible for the story was Alastair Boyd, a Nessie believer. In 1979, Boyd saw what appeared to be a huge animal in Loch Ness. That experience made him question the surgeon's photograph. I was suspicious of a hoax, actually, to begin with, because I'd always felt that, uh, firstly, the water texture in the surgeon's photo indicates to me that we're looking at a small object, probably no more than a foot high, and these are ripples rather than waves. Boyd's investigation led to a man named Christian Sperling, who claimed that the surgeon, Dr. Wilson, had been part of a plot to dupe a London newspaper. The object in the photograph was a one-foot plastic neck that Sperling had grafted to a toy submarine. This confession dealt a powerful blow to the Loch Ness Monster. We don't know exactly where Wilson was when he took this photograph or claimed to take the, the photograph, uh, but he indicated that he was... But to American journalist Richard Smith, the confession didn't ring true. With Rhines' support, Smith has come to the lock to find out if the hoax story may itself be a hoax. It's extremely important to the Academy, to us, to the public, to know, is the photograph possibly real, is the photograph possibly a hoax? Because it's going to take everybody's work from now until doomsday. This is such a well-recognized photo. Let's get at it and let's find out, is it real or is it a hoax? My research has shown that uh, the circumstances, as best we know, surrounding the Wilson photo are consistent with Wilson's stories. I think that uh, I'm willing to go out on a limb, as it were, and uh, uh, do this investigation. I think it's certainly worthwhile, no matter what the outcome is. Is this a one-foot model photographed from up close, or the four-foot neck of a living animal shot from a distance? To find out, Smith has built two floating necks. One is one foot high and the other four foot high. His plan is to photograph them from different vantage points to see which one matches the original photo. Smith's experiment is possible only because of the discovery of a new version of the surgeon's photo. One thing that's absolutely crucial to understand is that the familiar Nessie image, the familiar surgeon's photograph, is actually a cropped detail of a central portion of a much wider view. The narrow strip of the far shoreline and the absence of near shoreline show how the picture was framed, and the ripples around the object provide a second clue. The circular disturbance is also very interesting because it's been used to calculate the angle at which the uh, picture was taken, assuming that that's a round disturbance in the water, but of course we don't see it round because we're at an angle, it turns into an ellipse. Analysis of the ellipse shows that the camera was pointing at an angle of 19 degrees down from the horizon. This area changed a lot. Is the terrain different now? It's Using these clues to guide his experiment, Smith has recruited a surveyor and a professional photographer to help him duplicate the surgeon's photo. And put on the rangefinder. There we are. 19 degrees. Excellent. Let's see what we got. And that's very close. That's, I think it's dead on to the, the original uh, aspect ratio and the original uh, scene. You know, stretch right out with it. That's it! Moved a little bit to the, this, uh, this direction. Down on the shoreline where Sperling said the photograph was taken, Smith tests the one-foot model. Is this matching the original photograph at all? 
Yeah, the, the scale of the object is right, but it's far too far away. Uh -huh. So it's higher up in the picture. Yeah. So it seems like the problem is that when we get this thing more positioned than it's actually in the photograph, it becomes too big. Not much too big. The first one that we shot. Okay, now this is, and this is the four foot high target. Yes. That's mm -hmm. at, as I recall, this is at the three foot elevation. At long the next level. morning, the rest of the team look at the prints. Obviously. This to Rhines and Wyckoff, the one foot model doesn't match the original photo. The four foot model is more convincing. Since the hoax was supposed to have been carried out with a one foot model, the new evidence suggests that the picture may not be a hoax after all. Which is when you put together the basic elements, the kind of camera Wilson claimed to have used, the kind of the position where he, he believed he was, and a target of about the size he reported, you come up with a photograph that he claimed to have taken. This is certainly, although not proof, it is, I think, some very compelling evidence that perhaps the original testimony of Lieutenant Colonel R. Kenneth Wilson was genuine. Smith is convinced. Now it's up to the doubters. It could be very possible that they could come up with a photographic experiment in which uh, you know, their picture will look a lot more like this. And I hope that will happen, but it needs to be done. A short way down the loch, Alistair Boyd decides to take up Smith's challenge, with the ever-skeptical Shine lending a helping hand. This looks about ideal, doesn't it? I mean, we just want with a one-foot styrofoam model, they hope to prove the photo was a hoax. They too are careful to angle their camera at 19 degrees. OK, Adrian, yeah, just coming into frame slightly. That's just back off slightly. That's good. On the left is the recreation, on the right is the original. Despite the near identical images, Smith is unconvinced. See, now this is a very interesting experiment, and uh, you know, you're getting something which is certainly very close. One problem that I've always had, and it's certainly very much demonstrated by this, is the ripple patterns around the object. You we can't reproduce them. them. No, 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 we, we were getting well, ripple patterns. I'm, I'm sorry, we were getting ripple well, patterns. I don't see them in the photograph. Well, and Boyd's experiment shows that a one-foot model can produce an image much like the surgeon's photo. The hoax story might well be true. But debunking the photo doesn't change Boyd's conviction that the creature in the loch is quite real. I know that the thing I saw was not a log or an otter or a wave or anything like that. It was a large animal. It came heaving out of the water, something, something like a whale. I mean, the part that was actually on the surface when it stopped rolling through was at least 20 feet long. It was totally extraordinary. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. And if I could afford to spend the rest of my life up here looking for another glimpse of it, I would. Meanwhile, the sonar team has been working around the clock in the hopes of making another sighting. Dispersing a bit. I believe this is probably a school of fish. So far, without success. On the other hand, it has been around for quite a long time. Day three of the expedition. With the camera team still out of action, Wyckoff has joined Rhines aboard the sonar boat for a night run. I just hope we get something at night, though. You know, I just, I almost feel it in my bones or something going to happen. You feel it? I'll feel it too. All right, no, <laughs> <laughs> just so. That's where we'll get it if we get it. Tonight, they will concentrate on Urquhart Bay, the deepest part of the log. And of course, this is the time, this is the circumstances in which the academies had luck back in 1972 and big things coming in. After several hours of routine searching, there's a flurry of activity. What the heck is that? Yeah. We got a target. What's the, what's this? That's, that's a very that's hard return. return. That's a very hard return, very discreet. A number of targets have appeared on the printout. One catches Arnie Carr's attention. He estimates it's five meters or 16 feet long. Okay. Height 180 to port, yeah. and do a reciprocal of what you've already done. 
Using the GPS relay system, they turn around to search the same area again. If the target is still there on the second pass, it's probably stationary debris. If not, it's moving. Gentlemen, we may just have seen nothing. It was a dense, discreet target, and what we expected to do is we did a quick reciprocal to come back over that target with the sonar, and we couldn't see it. It was gone. Hence, uh, we saw it one time, went over the same area, didn't see it again. It's moving. To marine biologist Arnie Carr, the size and density of the mark on the printout indicate a large, solid mass, very different from a shoal of fish. It's an unusual target, especially the density. I mean, a moving target we've had before, but one with such a density we haven't had. Well, if you get into like a whale or something like that, yes, you will find something that dense. Usually some of the whales obviously will be larger, but five meters is not small. Carr's analysis makes it imperative to try and get photographic images of the target. The next morning, Wyckoff's team is back in action. They've replaced the video camera with a professional underwater model. This camera is a uh, much more sensitive camera, so we can, we can see farther underwater and uh, it'll go deeper. The other camera was limited because we had a scuba diver's housing for it. We could only go down maybe 150 feet. This we can go down to several hundred meters. This definition we're getting is just fantastic. It really is. Look, we can see the bottom detail in great... Uh, well, we think With so. the new well, camera the performing area, even you know, better than expected, the, the expedition area. is back and up to speed. There, we'll be able to see it. There's a sense of anticipation that the long search is about to pay off. Long-necked monsters have been reported in northern lakes all over the world, from Lake Kair in Siberia to Lake Champlain in North America. Can all these sightings be explained away as optical illusions or hoaxes? Or might the eyewitnesses be seeing creatures unknown to science? What it wasn't was a boat, what, it wasn't a deer, and it wasn't a swan. We're very well aware of sizes on the loch. Whatever it was has started to move. I looked at it on and off for a few seconds because I was driving. Um, must have seen it three or four times. And the last time I looked, it was gone. So one of the objectives of my quest here has been to teach science a lesson. That they've got to learn to evaluate eyewitness responses, emotional responses, and other things that are very real. They may not be anywhere near 100% accuracy, but they deserve to be fit into the total totality of the of the evidence. Rhines's conviction is shared by Roy Mackel, a pioneer in the field of cryptozoology, a science dedicated to the study of cryptids or unknown animals. Mackel, a molecular biologist by training, came to Scotland in the 1960s and joined a local group of enthusiasts who kept a constant vigil on the loch. His work helped persuade Rhines that there was something here worth investigating. I came because I was curious and all we had basically were a few still photographs, some of which have since turned out to be frauds. But the eyewitness observations, while the least valid evidence, nevertheless in some cases were very compelling. I wonder if you could if, if you could sketch the outline of what you saw, just as a, a, make a water line and then make sort of sketch what, what you saw. It's been 30 years since Mackel first interviewed eyewitnesses, and the descriptions remain the same. Long before Sir Peter Scott and the Highland tourist industry made it popular, people were convinced that Nessie was a prehistoric relic. Huge humps, I reckon, about between four to six feet above water level, I went straight home, into the house, got out my book of prehistoric creatures, and the nearest I could liken it to was the place you saw. 
Plesiosaurs were cold-blooded marine reptiles that coexisted with the dinosaurs during the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods, feeding on fish in warm inland seas. They look like giant turtles with long necks. They swam rather like penguins. If you can imagine a giant penguin with four limbs going up and down, you've got a plesiosaur. As far as we can tell, they died out 70 million years ago. But the oceans are home to a variety of prehistoric relics. From the massive mega-mouth shark, discovered in 1976, to the coelacanth, a fish once thought to have died out at the same time as the plesiosaurs. The coelacanth here is a, a very remarkable fish because it's a form that was thought extinct for 60 to 80 million years, and then all of a sudden it's found alive, uh, the form is found alive in 1938. It proves that if it can happen once, it can happen again. Could a small population of plesiosaurs have escaped extinction, taking up refuge in Loch Ness? The loch's geological origins hold the answer. Loch Ness straddles the Great Glen, a massive geological fault that nearly cut Scotland in two. As the land masses on either side of the fault slid by each other, they created an area of shattered rock or breccia. Each time an ice age descended on the northern hemisphere, the glaciers returned, repeatedly carving out this breccia to form a deep basin. As the ice moved down from the tributary valleys on either side of us, it got confined into the valley created along the fault and it accelerated. And this acceleration deepened the floor of the loch. So we've got successive major glaciations and during each one, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper into the fault breccia along the line of the fault. And then it opens out, the ice opens out at Inverness and so it ceases to erode down. So that's why we've got an enclosed basin over 800 feet deep at this locality. Plesiosaurs could not have survived in Loch Ness since the age of the dinosaurs, because for much of that time, it was a solid block of ice. But when the glaciers retreated 11,000 years ago, they left behind a deep pool of water and a shallow passage to the sea, the River Ness. Could plesiosaurs have used the river to enter the loch? It's an unlikely scenario. Even if they had escaped extinction in the open oceans, these cold-blooded reptiles would have had to adapt to the near freezing temperatures of Loch Ness. After carefully considering all of the evidence, most importantly, sonar contacts, which gave, give some idea of how these animals move and how fast they can swim. This convinced me that we had to have an aquatic mammal. Warm-blooded mammals have the metabolism to thrive in cold water, and one primitive species of whale had the often reported serpentine neck. It's known as an archaeocete. This is a long snake-like whale known from the, uh, from the fossil record, uh, thought to be extinct for 18 million years. But clearly some have uh, survived, and this is not a, a, a surprise because we have other animals which were thought to be extinct 70 million years ago and they're alive and well. So could Loch Ness sustain a breeding colony of these animals? Adrian Schein and fish biologist Alan Butterworth have set out this morning to explain the loch's ecology. Loch Ness is a huge body of water, more water than in the whole of England and Wales put together, but it's very unproductive. There are very few chemical nutrients, you know, the fertilizers, uh, to start the food chain off. And the little microscopic plants have got another problem as well. There's very little light penetration, and I'm going to just show you here. This is a, called a secchi disc, and it, it goes down, and I've got to see where I lose sight of it. So it's going down into the water, you can see how brown the water colour is. It's gone at about four metres down. Now, that's pretty poor. The dim light stifles plant growth, an effect that ripples up the food chain. 
starting with the tiny plankton that feed on vegetation. Well, we're right in the middle of the lot, we're in the, the deepest part of the northern basin, and what we're looking at is, is the, the food source of the fish that live out here. So I'm pulling up through some 30 meters of water, that's just about down to where the plankton go by day, they migrate downwards by day. Well, what's happened, this is actually not a lot of animals in there, but when you think that that's from about three cubic meters of water, there's not a lot left, you know, not a lot there to feed on. So the food supply is very poor. Because of this limited food supply, the number of fish living in Loch Ness is surprisingly small for so large a lake. But there's another possible food supply, migratory salmon which pass through the loch on their way to spawn. You will get quite large numbers passing up close on this shore. And these can be big fish, they can weigh up to 20 or 30 pounds. And we can work out that at most there will be something like 15 tons of salmon passing through the loch within a monthly period. That is still not a lot of food to support a population of large predators. There is only one other explanation for what Nessie might be, a visitor from the sea. There is one creature, very reptilian in appearance. It is actually the largest fish you will ever see in fresh water where it eats nothing. I think it's possible that the tradition itself was begun by Baltic sturgeon making the occasional entrance to the loch, not finding mates, and then going away again. A large sturgeon could pass in and out of the loch undetected, as could a large eel. Eels have been known to reach ten feet in length in the open ocean. Either one would explain the sonar hits. But the eyewitnesses don't buy it. I, along with a friend, was on the south shore of Loch Ness, fishing for brown trout. I saw an object surface. It was a large black object, a whale-like object, going from infinity up and came round onto a block end. Retired policeman Ian Cameron, along with seven other people, reported one of the longest sightings on record, lasting almost an hour. The nearest thing would be sort of the back of a massive elephant if you cut bits off and replaced it. Have you ever gone out in the lock on a boat since? No, not in the life. I wouldn't go out in a small boat in Loch Ness, supposing you'd give me the whole earldom of the north. Day five, the lock is calm. A good day for Nessie hunting. Well, this is our last day with Arnie on the towing side scan. After that, we have to do fixed side scan. Yep. So we got to make the most of the day. Now we've got all our bugs out of our equipment. By now, Rhines has complete faith now, in his experienced sonar team. This last day the pressure is on the untried out. camera crew. You guys got to be ready. The we'll minute, be ready. We'll the minute we get okay. that target, yep. Come. For today's last search, Rhines has decided to focus again on Urquhart Bay. Late in the morning, the boat's fish finder records a target at a depth of 25 meters. What have you got? Wow. What, 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 what is it about? 10 meters, 20 meters? What? About, um, about 25 meters. Yeah. 25 meters, we might pull that out of a okay. sonar. We'll check yep. it. Charlie, we've got a target on Gordon's sonar here. Hoping the side scan will pick it up. Can you get over here with the cameras? Right over. We're on our way. Well, I've got two targets in the mid-water area over here on port, about 60, 65 meters. Are you folks uh, picking up anything now? Because we find a couple of targets off your port side, maybe about 50 meters. Give that location again. Towards us, as fast as you can, please. 
The camera flips over if we go too fast. Pull it out and come over then. This is the expedition's biggest challenge, filming a moving target underwater. Three main targets and they're spread out. If they moved off in that port side over to the left, they could probably pick it up with their camera. We're getting mid-water targets here. 18 meters or so to port of us. Come as fast as you can. I'm, I'm seeing a target. I'm seeing a target that's coming at... Oh, look at look the fish. Look, look at all, all those fish. fish. A uh, small number of fish. Well, that, that small number of fish may be tracking larger <coughs> predators. Barney says a small number of fish may be followed by some hungry predators. Minutes later, the target is out of range. How close was Rhines to an answer? A question as elusive as the target itself. To Wyckoff, it's now clear that tracking and filming a moving target in the murky waters of Loch Ness requires resources well beyond the means of this expedition. But Rhines feels he has achieved his goal, finding out if there is still something here. Uh, we certainly weren't arrogant enough to think that we can cover every single spot in this lake and look in there and find a target. What we did was the most probable things, at least in our judgment. And if we can intrigue, and I think we have intrigued this new generation uh, to carry on, if there's enough excitement here about what we're doing, uh, we will have accomplished a lot. I don't think Bob Rines is uh, uh, crazy. Uh, he's obsessed, obviously, but I think the obsession is natural. It's a good human instinct. There's, there's something here that needs to be answered, something here that needs to be proven. Reports of monsters in Loch Ness demand skepticism, given the long history of hoaxes. And scientific evidence seems to rule out plesiosaurs or any other large resident predator. But a lake so deep could well have a few secrets left. Someday a more plausible explanation may emerge. Perhaps an occasional visitor from the sea. Until then, the unexplained sonar hits and the conviction of the eyewitnesses mean the mystery of Loch Ness is still to be solved. It was just big, I think is the best way to put it. So it certainly wasn't a seal, it certainly wasn't a fish. And uh, all I can say is that I suppose that looking at the loch, that somewhere in there, there's a Loch Ness monster. And as far as I'm concerned, I've seen it. Though I remain convinced of the sincerity of many of the eyewitnesses, the majority of sightings are actually boat wakes and all the other hosts of illusion that you can get on Loch Ness, particularly on a calm day. I saw what I saw and I'm not going to be dissuaded. I, I know and it wasn't just, you know, an, an imagination and I'm, I'm, I'm a sane guy. I've got no axe to grind. As I say, I sell pet food. What, what used to me is a, is a Loch Ness monster. Yeah, I could wake up tomorrow and find that the Loch Ness Monster has just crawled ashore with a large sign saying, Gah, boo, sucks, fooled you again. Um, well, it's, it wouldn't be the first time scientists have been wrong. We've been wrong before, we're going to be wrong again. And uh, maybe there's something about Loch Ness we don't know after all. In no way am I even attempting to convert anybody to the religion of the object in Loch Ness. But I saw it. And nothing can take that away. And the hunt is on for vampires next Monday at the earlier time of 7 o'clock. Now tonight on 4, Ian Paisley, as you've never seen him before, as a missionary in Africa. John Ronson witnesses the fire and brimstone next. <laughs>